Hello, everyone. I'm here with Kyori Busaki. Thanks a lot for joining us on the ACID podcast. So as a quick introduction, you are the big, big professor of neuroscience at NYU, working on memory, sleep, and neural syntax. So basically on the question of how information in the brain is organized and intertwined with cognitive function. Uh, you have been awarded the Brain Prize and are also one of the most respected and most cited neuroscientists on the planet. So it's, it's a great pleasure that you took the time to join us today. It's my pleasure. And you have also authored two great books, Rhythms of the Brain in 2006, and your recent book, The Brain from Inside Out, that came out in 2019. And I think there's so much interesting neuroscience in these two books that we could probably talk about them for several days. And I probably have way too many questions, but perhaps we can just jump right in with The Brain from Inside Out. And in this book, you, you propose a pretty dramatic paradigm shift in how neuroscience should think about the brain. So just as a starting point, what were the most important factors and maybe frustrations that made you realize that you needed to write this book? Uh, you mentioned paradigm shift. Paradigm shift work always, works always in, in retrospect. Nobody can, nobody can shift the field. You know, it is like saying that you know, how you re replace a theory, no amount of good data will replace the theory. Only another theory can. So this applies also to shifts in thinking. What I was trying to do is that maybe there is an alternative way how you can view the brain. And this is why I was motivated to write my book. This has matured over the many years. And uh, uh, the further back I reached in history, the more I realized that a lot of the terms that we are using in neuroscience have been invented many, many, many years before we actually thought that thoughts are associated or, or having anything to do with the brain. And so once you think about it, they said, oh, this is an interesting thing. We have a vocabulary that we are using, but it was concocted by our predecessors who didn't know anything about neural mechanisms. So how come that today's neuroscience, without questioning these, these terms, are looking for mechanisms and boundaries with the same kind of boundaries that uh, that existed in our thoughts. Uh, and, and in order to negotiate about those terms and have an agreement, you need some sort of a, a grounding mechanism. You would like to know to connect it to something more solid. And the only thing that is more solid than the mind is the brain. So why don't we start with the brain? So that's the, that's the idea. We can jump right into the, the inside-out approach. So can you give a short outline what the inside-out approach is and how it differs from this outside-in perspective? Well, every coin has two sides. <laughs> and uh, so you, you can start with your ideas and uh, look for mechanisms. And the other way around is uh, you, of course, we, we have ideas. You, you, many times I have been accused, so to speak, that I want to build up the brain from the bottom, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, I'm not so naive that we go to the lab and poke into the brain and do something and all of a sudden, you know, all these important terms and, and definitions will pop up. No, we already have our preconceptions and over the past millennia, I would say, or more, uh, we have accumulated a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, ideas about how things should or could work, and uh, now maybe it's the the it's it's time to think about how brain mechanisms can give rise to things that we haven't thought of or things that are already there. We just have to define them a little bit better. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, memory is one of those things we all agree on, upon. You know, everybody knows what memory is. Everybody has a memory. Uh, what about another term such as imagining or planning? And uh, that's already an interesting thing. We know what imagining is. We know what planning is. Maybe the two of them are related to each other. But how they are related to memory is a uh, interesting question. We all agree, I think, that there is no future without the past. There is no planning and there is no imagination without memory yet. Traditionally and historically, these 
so-called entities have been researched in different labs and people are recording from different parts of the brain and so on. Over the past several years, it seems that ideas are converging both from bottom-up electrophysiology as well as from uh, imaging studies in, in humans that they are not so different. In fact, they are interacting very effectively. They are interacting within a single theta cycle. <laughs> there is no way to tell which one is the future, which one is the present, which one is the past. And uh, when, uh, when uh, surprisingly, when, when people have looked at what areas of the brain will light up, so to speak, with the with fMRI, then they found that uh, during imagining or you know, planning something in for the future, these were pretty much the same areas as uh, as memory. So maybe with this approach, uh, perhaps in the not so distant future, we will have a better way of grappling onto this and say, oh, huh, uh, we don't have to talk about separately about these items, but they may be related to each other. And there are many of the many examples like this. Uh, for example, you can you can study the the brain. We will maybe talking about a little bit later for the sake of uh, organization. He said, well, the way how the brain is organized is through chunks of time, which we can call rhythms. And uh, those rhythms can do this and this and this and this. And then many investigators, including linguists and people who are interested in music uh, or anybody who's interested in uh, transforming or, 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 or or, or packing information, we realize that oh, this is a natural substrate, and it can be exploited for various things. So you know, we are when we are looking for attention, we don't find that attention is associated with theta and gamma oscillation, but we do the other way around. There are theta and gamma oscillations that means this and this and this physiologically, and that could be used for a variety of different things, including cognition. So this is the, you know, the the, the, the two way thinking. And uh, what I, I'm proposing is that we have done too much in terms of search uh, for mechanisms, structures, homes for our ideas. And maybe we can shift the balance a little bit to the other direction. Let's think a little bit more about brain mechanisms. So. Yeah, you mean basically that the mind is in the way because it has preconceived notions about what we are expecting to find in the brain. And this kind of clouds our judgment when we actually look at what's what's happening from a mechanistic perspective. Absolutely. We always go into the to the lab with a bias. And and that's the that's the that's the important thing is that how do we we, we cannot push aside our bias, but how we can correct it. And one of the other cornerstones, I think, of your theory is that um, neural uh, syntax is already pre-existing in the brain and has to be grounded uh, through action in, in meaning. So can you ex elaborate on this a little bit, is it what this means? Oh, these are two large areas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just start with, with, with syntax. Again, this is an idea, you know, it's, it's not an elaborate, uh, uh, a, a theory or anything, uh, but if you just sit back for a second and say, well, everybody's talking about information processing. And, uh, half of the introduction start with that. And then you can ask, you know, what the heck is it? I don't understand what information is. I don't understand what processing is. So when we put together two things that we don't understand, that the result is, <laughs> is not much understanding. Now we can simplify it and say, oh, wherever, if you define information in the Shannonian sense that in order to be useful, information is not in the sender. Information is always in the receiver. And what you can call a cipher or a code, you know, we talk about neural codes, that's another mysterious word. A code is basically an agreement between the sender and the receiver. If there is no cipher, we will never understand anything. So that's the idea to find some so the, the cipher and how how information, if you want, or, or neuronal patterns are packaged to make sense to the receiving structures. Uh, now, in every system, 
in every system where information is being sent, it has to be packaged. It, it's, it, it typically doesn't happen in one shot. If our you know, interview would be just one very long sentence without any interruption, it would be very difficult to comprehend. And if it would be you know, the, the Morse code just uh, with, with two signs or just action potentials without any interruptions, there would be no way to de decipher the meaning. So we have to package or make everything in chunks and in chunks that are intelligent to the reader, to the observer or to the receiver. Now, it just happens, if you want, that the brain already provides you such a syntax. And the way it happens is that you can think about the various brain, brain rhythms that are out there. And uh, the, the, we, can, we can think about everything in the brain that is a, uh, or brain dynamic that is a consequence of the underlying brain rhythms. And their interference generates some complicated patterns. But the interesting thing about this is that, that they have a relationship to each other. There are about 10 plus minus maybe a, a few uh, neuronal oscillations in the brain. And if you put them on a log scale, it turns out that the, the mean or median frequency is just lining up on this log scale. Now, from the physics perspective, you can say, oh, what happens here is that there is a, uh, a, a percolation or there is a, a, a a, a, a cascade that it works that the low frequencies affect the higher ones and the higher ones affect the even higher ones. And that's, this is translated as a, a phase power coupling that is being used over and over and over in, in many areas of neuroscience. Now, you, you don't necessarily have to believe in oscillations because it, it, it it, it is true also when you just look at the irregular patterns such as the ocean waves, where the, the waves and the little wavelets and so on, they are related to each other. But nevertheless, it gives you a temporal framework or temporal frames for what we need for any kind of syntax. In other words, if you would like to compute something very fast, in the brain because of its physical properties and conduction delays and so on, it's typically local. For example, the, the fastest uh, oscillation that or fastest uh, pattern that we know is a uh, hippocampal sharp wave ripple. That's about 200 hertz or a little bit lower, but in, in some cases it can go up. Um, so that, that is typically local because you don't have time in the five millisecond wave times to transmit the information elsewhere. But if you have a longer event, let's say uh, a second, then maybe half of the brain can be involved. So there is a nice rule is that the slower the frequency, the larger the, the, the brain volume that can be involved. So if you would like to communicate with far away lens from the uh, entorhinal cortex to the prefrontal cortex in the brain, then your best bet is a slower oscillation. But you would like to have precision, therefore it's good to have a faster one such as the gamma oscillation that is modulated by the low ones. So I'll give you an example for, for, for this, this cascade or cross-frequency phase coupling. Again, I mentioned the hippocampal ripple. The ripple, in, which is locally generated in the CA1 region of the hippocampus, it is being modulated by incoming thalamocortical sleep spindles. And they are about uh, 12 to 18 hertz. Now, these oscillations are modulated by a slower pattern. We call it slow oscillations after Mir Chasteria, they're my good friend. And, uh, and uh, that modulation is also very robust. And it's, it's, a, it's a much wider area in the, in the brain. Slow oscillations are, tra are traveling waves. They are invading the entire neocortex. Now, this, let's say 0 0.5 to 1.5 hertz, uh, slow oscillation is modulated of, of, of phase locked to a slower rhythm, which we can call the ultra slow or 0 0.1 hertz, which is the bold signal. This is what everybody sees in the fMRI. Or if you are looking at the uh, uh, circulation, uh, blood flow and so on, it, it is already there. So this is a 
very nice, robust example. Is this what is exploited by the brain? We know it is from, from various resources and various experiments. But, but when we started, of course, that was not very trivial. What was trivial, that is there. If it is there and it is organized, it's almost ex impossible that nature doesn't exploit it for something. So this is the idea about, uh, about uh, 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 cell assemblies and, well, first of all, about syntax, and it, it leads us to, to the next uh, problem is that you know, how this organization is made. So if you want to interrupt with questions or going, go ahead. Yeah, maybe there's an, an interesting thing to, to note here quickly, because in your book, you also mentioned the idea that basically every single neuron is, is blind to where it's at in the brain. And you have this kind of problem of relativity that it doesn't know if a signal is coming in from far or is coming in from close. Uh, and you, you only have basically the, the information coming in and these neural rhythms are like a beautiful way of, of helping the neuron kind of determine where information is coming from or synchronizing with uh, neurons that are like, happening in a place pretty far away. Um, so it's a super interesting question, right? Does, first of all, we, we, before we would like to answer the question how, we would like to question of, uh, answer the question whether it is yes or no. Does a neuron know and care where the information is coming from? Does it matter for a neuron in the brainstem whether the command signal or the actual potential was, was sent by a neighboring neuron or from the prefrontal cortex? Now, we tend to think in, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the big picture because we are interested in, in, in the human mind and I, we always want to assume a, a super over-organizer, a, a supervisor that is controlling all of these interesting things. But, you know, maybe that's a uh, wishful thinking. We can have a, a, a extraordinarily beautifully organized system with completely local rules. Um, it is the, you know, the, the, the swarm organization, you know, the, the idea about uh, ants, ants and, and uh, termites and, and bees and so on, they, they show us that you can have an extraordinarily complicated looking or complex looking uh, organization with, with local rules also. But going back to the, to, to, to the, to the neuron itself, uh, it is a super interesting question whether the neuron knows where the information comes from. So, are there mechanisms? Yes, there are. And uh, recently with, with, uh, with my, my, my postdocs, we had some ideas about this, that it just turns out that during development, those inputs that are coming from the neighbors, uh, of course, they are attached to the dendrites when the dendrites are small. And then uh, the dendrites are, are, are growing, then there is more space. So the neurons that are sending axons from faraway places have no chance. They have to attach their synapses only to the distal dendrites. Now, if there is a gradient, and there are indications from uh, both in the cerebellum and in the in the in the neocortex that it may be the case that the neuron can discriminate between inputs coming to the distal dendrites or mid dendrites or proximal dendrites. So that could be one way. Is this important? I'm not so sure. Now. Let's let's think about something different that is more uh, exciting, perhaps, is that it's not about the, the distance, but about the synaptic weight. And we will talk about synaptic weights perhaps later. But we know that they, there's enormous variability between synaptic strengths, which are synaptic strength is correlated with the synaptic size or button size. And let's suppose that there is a button which is 100 times bigger than another one. Now, which inputs will be noticed by the postsynaptic neuron? When the activity of, of one input is uh, changing somewhat. So if the frequency of the neuron is, uh, of the small input is one hertz, the other one is 10 hertz, and each of them will add two spikes, in this case, there will be a triple change for the slow firing neuron and the small button, there will be only a small percentage for the larger one. 
So are they equal? For the neurons, if the neuron, the postsynaptic neuron just counts spikes, then you can say they are equal. But there is also a sense, and there is no good proof yet, but uh, that the proof is at a different level, or the support is at a different level, that the observers, the observer neurons, look at the proportional changes of the inputs. So in order to have the same impact going from 10 hertz, you have to have the same percentage of, of change. This is the famous Weber law. That is, that for me, way below is almost everything in the brain, uh, because you, you cannot. It's it's hard to find something that that uh, this log row rule is uh, somehow violated. Now, uh, the second interesting or related interesting question is that how does a neuron capable of lumping together things from above? What does it mean? What it means that. How does a observer neuron or a, a group of neurons say this is one chunk of information? And this is what Donald Hebb famously called neural assembly, that somehow is a unit of activity either viewed from the, uh, the, the, the brain side or when you are looking at from, uh, from, from psychology. Um, so what is an assembly? Now, of course, Hebb's... Uh, definition is impossible, I would say, to define or impossible to defend simply because it doesn't have a time frame. And if you don't have a time frame, then you can say, well, what is an assembly? In 10 milliseconds, only a limited number of neurons can be recruited. But if you relax the time, then, you know, in 10 seconds, half of the brain can be recruited. So let's look at the time frame. So for a, uh, just to make a long story short, you can ask the following question. And this is what we have asked with uh, Ken Harris, uh, my old, uh, not old, but my, my ex postdoc. Uh, if you can record from many neurons simultaneously with any chosen neuron, can you tell precisely when your chosen neuron will spike? And the answer is, yeah, if you have a lot of information, we, we are getting better and smarter. If you know what the animal is doing, you have a, uh, a relatively coarse prediction. Some neurons are firing faster when the animal is running and so on. Well, that's not very precise, but it's okay. If you know something about brain rhythms, let's say it's a hippocampal neurons, the theta oscillation, then your, your prediction could be improved quite a lot because in every single 120 milliseconds or so, you can make a prediction whether it's spiking or not. Now, if you are recording from many other neurons, the precision can be increased tremendously. Just like in an orchestra, when you are listening to the, you are the, the, one of the, the violinists and you listen to every single uh, other member, not only to the conductor, then your precision is pretty good. Now. Once you have such an observation, you can ask the important questions. The question is, uh, what is the time frame within you can get the best prediction? Is it a millisecond? Is it an hour or anything in between? And the answer is that yes, anything, something between. And it just happens that the best prediction occurs anywhere between 10 to 30 milliseconds. So if if you look at the postsynaptic neuron and said, oh, what is the best prediction? Then you can say it happens in this time frame, which in your mind is already associated with hippocampal or with, the, with, the, with gamma oscillation, because this is the time frame of the gamma. So why, why does it happen? And the answer is that the only reason, the only utility why neurons come together as an assembly is to have an impact on the target, in this case, is to discharge the postsynaptic neuron. Now, the magic time about this is because this is the membrane time constant of a typical pyramidal cell. So this integrator is integrating inputs in 10 to 30 milliseconds and says, oh, everybody, all the spikes, the neurons, the, the, the spikes from all neurons, I don't care where they come from, far away, close, neighbors, uh, from wherever, who spikes 
happen to be in my integration time window, I will lump it as one unit because I generate a spike. Everybody else who send the spikes later than 35 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, and so on, has to belong to an other entity. So by this definition, we defined from the point of view of the single neuron, which is big discharge, what is the assembly? And the assembly is a time frame defined co-firing, independent whether those neurons are connected or not. Whereas in HAPS framework, the connection is the, the, the fundamental thing. So this is an example how we can approach these problems that are pretty complex. And of course, the principle remains exactly the same. Now, if you have another reader mechanism, such as a, a cycle of a oscillation, where you have many, many neurons, but again, the time frame will determine how this, the, the, the observing neurons can classify and chunk the incoming information. Maybe to compare this at this point to like the other big information processing devices we have, which are computers that work on a very different architecture and they kind of have the luxury of, of being able to really address where certain information is coming from. You can, in, a, in the normal Turing machine or in, the, in a computer, you can simply label where a certain bit of information is coming from and you really don't need to work based on this temporal kind of integration of information. Do you think in the brain that's it's more a feature that uh, kind of this, if you need to connect uh, cell assemblies or spatially, you, you lose a lot of kind of flexibility in what kind of patterns you can generate because the temporal gives you like a temporal synchronization of information gives you a lot more flexibility which neuron can talk to which other neuron and building spatial connections is just really costly computation. I like speaking just from material perspective of evolution needing to save resources. Uh, again, I'd like to go back to my fundamental tenet is that like in evolution, everything can be explained easily when you create a goal. And without a goal, it's very difficult to explain evolution. However, there are no goals in evolution, <laughs> right? It is just a, a crutch for the human to explain things. So for me, this is the same principle that we should apply in the brain, that only the only thing that makes sense is from the point of view of a reader. The reader is the, the sorter, the classifier, the clusterer, and and only from the reader's point of view, things matter. There is no point of generating any pattern which is not received. If it is not translated, it's not actuated, it's not information. So if that is right, then we can look at it, you know, how this kind of uh, 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 reader-centered view can help us. And it does, so for example, in a Shannonian system, in the, let's take the simple one, there is a sender and a receiver, and the receiver, because this is a hypothetical system, then the computer systems are just a, a, a instantiation of, the, of, the, of this. They are always ready, not today's complicated ones, but in the simple situation, the, the computers are always ready, or the receivers are always ready to receive. Now, in the brain, it's not the case. Uh, the way how it typically works is that it is always the receiving structure or the receiving mechanism that initiates a dialogue. In computer science, you can say it's a lookup mechanism. That is, you call up your sender and said, okay, send me the information in the next 100 milliseconds or so. And this is where rhythms are also very convenient because rhythms have, and oscillations have a, a duty cycle and a perturbation cycle. So typically you can say half of it during half of the time of an oscillation cycle, you can perturb the rhythm very effectively. Other times it's not because this is the, when the, most of the neurons are spiking and this is in descending mode. So let's take an example. During waking, 
the hippocampal theta is a very powerful source of package packaging mechanism and it sends out messages to the neocortex at the frequency of about you know, about eight hertz and says oh i have to bias you and wherever there is some activity that is potentially interesting i phase lock the ongoing dialogue which is a gamma oscillation in other words hippocampal theta oscillations can phase lock relatively loosely the ongoing activity in the neocortex uh, fairly precisely. In other words, there is a coordination in time and coordination in phase. So the result of this is that now those neurons that want to say something to the hippocampus in different parts of the brain will be firing together. And they send it to the time of what to, at the phase when the hippocampus says, oh, I'm giving all my mind to you. I'm listening to you very effectively. So this is a, a very effective way of communication or efficient way of, of communication because it is the receiver who tells you that I'm ready. If, if, if you perturb that, then of course you can imagine what happens. And that happens in many, many situations. You know, every single psychiatric disease is associated with one form or other of, uh, of a brain rhythm problem. You know, many neurological diseases are, are pretty much the same. So this syntactical frame, if you want, or the, or the, 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 the time packaging frame is a widespread thing. Now, the interesting thing that why is it good that it's not only, uh, you know, a, a time frame, but also a neural mechanism. And the reason why I can say that is because every single brain rhythm that we are, know of, at least uh, in, in, in this uh, 10 classes, are based on inhibition. So inhibition is a natural way of ending a, a, a package of information. And, and this is, of course, how you can concatenate things. So as I mentioned, the, the gamma oscillations are, uh, for me, those are the neural ladders, if you want, because they are defining the cell assemblies and you can put seven plus minus two gamma in a theta cycle and so on. And the theta cycles can be packaged in a, a, sl a slow patterns and so on. So this is, this is a good thing. As long as the downstream reader mechanisms have access to the same phase information. So that, that yeah, we can yeah. talk about this a little bit later, that you know how important it is that to have coordination. If you don't have coordination, then that you cannot share a cipher. You cannot have a code between the two, then the, the, the target neurons or the downstream readers are helpless. And I think one of the important points in your book is that this really the sophisticated coordination and this complex dynamics that are existing in the brain are already to a degree pre-existing and pre-wired when the brain comes to, comes to be born. And it, it's actually really difficult to learn this, these dynamics from scratch, basically. So I think maybe we can connect this now to, the, to this action perspective of grounding the pre-existing dynamics in, in meaning through action. Well, in, in, in history of science, not only neuroscience, in every field of science, we always start with folk thinking, you know, we, we like to know how this, why the stars are shining, the, why the sun sets and so on. So we have preconceived ideas always, and that's natural and this is how it should be. Now, when it came to the brain, of course, the brain is, a, is an interesting structure only from the 19th century. Everybody was interested in the mind. And so how the mind works and you know, you use various metaphors. In science, we always use metaphors. And the reason why we use metaphors is because of what we call a grounding problem, that you understand something only if you can attach it to an already existing stronger knowledge. <laughs> and they say, oh, the brain is like, and you know, you can pick up and choose your, your favorite uh, uh, metaphor. And today, of course, is either the computer or the internet. Uh, but 
you know, 50 years from now, it will be a totally ridiculous <laughs> metaphor, probably. Uh, so, of course, you know, in, back in the old days, the easiest thing was to say, oh, this is like a, you know, there was no piece of paper, but there was a tablet that said, oh, this is like a blank, blank slate. This is just empty. The newborn child is, is uh, again, we completely forgotten that there is evolution to the mind or the evolution to the brain. First of all, we were not interested in, in anything else because the mind was a possession only of humans. So who cares about other creatures who don't have a mind? So the, the, the mind is empty initially and we fill it up uh, with information. They didn't use the word information, but with stuff uh, as you grow and you get older. And, you know, this is a persuasive idea. It's good because it's so simple and so easy to understand for everybody. The problem is just total nonsense. Uh, it just cannot be right. And the reason why it cannot be right is, is there are millions of ways of, 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 of approaching this. But, you know, one of them is to build it, you know, several people said <laughs> from Turing and others famously that once we build something, we understand it. Now, their recipe, of course, was to build a computational platform and see what happens. And uh, what they do is exactly what neuroscientists or back then psychologists or whatever you call these people who were interested in the brain told them, and which is basically the tabula rasa idea. So even today's world, most of the AI platforms are based on this idea that you make something and then it's dead. In order to give life to them, you put a lot of noise into it. Noise is a crutch of a computation in neuroscientist because that's what is, is needed. And you, you do that because without that, there is not much activity. Or if you have activity, then it, 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 it lasts for a short period of time and it becomes dead silent afterwards. So in order to maintain a pattern, a complex pattern for a long period of time, it requires a lot of effort. And it doesn't happen very easily in a, a, a simple system uh, because there are many things that are compete with each other in the brain, such as robustness, stability, plasticity, changeability, preservation, and these are all competing things. Now, nature, not only the brain, but in general, uh, biological systems solve these competing problems with diversity. And that's a super important insight that we have to look for ex extraordinary diversity inside the brain as well. And of course, you know, there are many people who say, oh, there are many, many different types of neurons. How many we don't exactly know? And so on. So this is what I call component diversity, that there are there are many different components. It's not like uh, the gases where there are many, many, many different particles interacting with each other, but they are pretty much the same. We and colony. Oh, we, we know that there are, you know, different size of, 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 of ants and there, are, there is a division of labor there as well, especially in, in bee colonies, but it's, it's compared to the brain is relatively minuscule. Now, what happened, of course, with, uh, with evolution is that a few types of the cells started to multiply in large, large, large numbers, such as the pyramidal cells. And, but then we, not so long ago, you know, when you were in uh, preschool a few years ago, um, <laughs> then <laughs> well, elementary school, you learned, oh, there are pyramidal cells in the brain. They all are the same, you know, pyramidal cells are as many, but the same. Now we know it's not the case. There is enormous, even in the, in the layer five pyramidal cell, every cell is almost different because their firing rays, their bursting patterns, and there are intrinsic properties are so different. There are orders of magnitude differences. So now, in, in, from this perspective, we said, oh, what do all these neurons do? And you can say, what is the, you can ask a foolish questions such as, what does the brain have to do? And I call it a foolish question because we have no clue and this is not a good approach. Yet, if you read many papers today, the first sentence of the introduction is that the brain must, 
of the brain have to and so on and then you go from there with your arguments you know how you set up the experiment to to prove what the brain must to do and this is a uh, uh, this just shows our ignorance but I, I think it's not a good idea. Nevertheless, so we already know that there is this you know, diversity, and that it's, you know, with this arrogance, I can arrogance. I can also ask, you know, what is it good for? And I say, well, to maintain the brain dynamic. The number one goal of the brain is to maintain its own dynamic. And if it is maintained, then you have to ask, you know, what ingredients are needed, what mechanisms are needed, why the rhythms are there, and so on. So, well, if, if this is the case, then how do the brains develop from small to large and uh, across evolution and within the, the, the life of an organism? And it seems to be a rule that, that is persuasive, namely that very large amount of resources are dedicated to maintain this dynamic. If I ask you, you know, how many spikes are quote unquote wasted just uh, to maintain the dynamic and what percentage is left for quote unquote information processing then what is your answer maybe the 10 percent that people always talk about okay what if i i tell you more than half would you be surprised uh I think most people yeah. would be surprised, yeah. 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 but it, it is probably the right number that a very large part of the resources are just there to maintain mm -hmm. its own dynamic. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the brain is not built in a way that every single time there is, you learn something new, then it's put it in and it's added to the existing ones. If that would be the case, then it's very easy to predict that the complexity of the brain would be scaled or would be proportional with the amount of information that you learn. Okay, in that case, uh, the brain of a Nobel laureate should be more complex than that of a, uh, uh, I, you know, every, every brain is important and, and, and interesting and useful, but let's say somebody who, never went to school, lives in an island, and uh, met only three people in her entire life and so on. Uh, and you examine that brain, synapse-wise, uh, you look at the EEG, MEG, whatever you want, that would be fundamentally different. The rules will be exactly the same. In other words, you can add any amount of information to the brain without perturbing its complexity, perturbing its, its, its dynamic. And this is a very important thing because it's very different from AI where catastrophic interference is a big issue. And uh, so that's, that's just the introduction, <laughs> what I tried to say. So when, when uh, viewed from the, of course, as I said, nobody believes in, in the tabula rasa or under the blank slate. Nevertheless, when we design our experiments, and when we interpret our data in our mind, this is exactly the, the framework. And, and, and uh, we expect that it will be a big change. You know, firing rates should change because we gave energy to the brain. Therefore, we energize the brain. There should be an excitatory response. And when you don't see that, then you are surprised. There may be a tiny little timing difference or phase difference. And that's where the information is hiding or the, the important thing, but you, you don't see it because you don't expect that. So if, if that approach or that, that discussion, what we just had, has some validity, then you can say, well, it is learning is not something that you add to an existing pattern and perturb the other ones. And then, then you have to classify over and over and over slowly that thing, what it means, uh, but you can think about different ways. And the way I envision this is that we already generate myriads of patterns. The hippocampus of the rat, which is a tiny structure uh, relative to the human brain, is capable of generating unbelievable number of, of sequences. But 
Of course, the information is not in the sequences. The information is always in the reader. <laughs> and so the important thing is how these patterns are read out by the neocortex. And if you look at or compare the rodent brain with the human brain, you will see that the relative size between the hippocampal volume and the neocortical volume is changing. The potential readers are much, much, much higher. So with that, what we have done is that we improve the richness of information, quote unquote, because we added a lot more readers. And so we don't have to be scared that there are not enough patterns in the brain that could be used for something. So now if we have enough of these patterns, we don't necessarily have to build these patterns, but what I call match them or unmask them. So when we are having this conversation and we are learning something from each other, what happens is, is that we pull out or the brain pulls out the most probability the most probable patterns that applies to the situations. And then there are reserves there for patterns that haven't been used yet, or there are tails of these existing sequences to which you can assign the new information. So this is what I call a matching. And this is what I would, would agree with you that, you know, this is an upside down relative to the dominant thinking is that we have to add information rather than to, to match information. And this is a much more effective way in, I, I, again, I, I don't know because we don't have a head to head comparison, but I assume, and I believe that it may be a more efficient way than the other way around. Yeah, what is what I find interesting you you mentioned AI at this point with this, which has a couple of issues with catastrophic forgetting, for example, and the inability to really generalize across like limited problems. Do you think there are any ideas uh, in AI that you currently find interesting from this inside out perspective that kind of try to implement this or try to look at AI also from this new perspective? Or would you say there's something there that can be learned for AI researchers from the brain in this regard? Well, we can distinguish AI and people who are doing AI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Definitely. people who are doing AI are extremely, extremely smart people. Any mainstream, especially these days, you know, AI is a big, big thing. Anybody I know in this field are, is, is an extraordinary guy or, or, or woman. So there is nothing wrong, of course. It's not that I am smarter than you, but how we approach different things. And I would say, hmm, yeah, they have, there are, attempts, perhaps independent of brain research, such as reservoir computing. You know, reservoir computing basically has the same kind of thing, although it was, was uh, you know, just an initial attempt and uh, it was abandoned, if you want. But some people like Wolfgang Maas, you know, they, they persist that it's a good idea and I agree with him that it just have to be done right. It hasn't have to be a rigid, you know, structure. It can be a flexible structure. Just the way I, I imagine in the brain is that there is some uh, enough plasticity, but not everything is super plastic. So it, the, the, these patterns could be conceived as, as, as Legos and then ready-made Legos. And you just have to concatenate them in a different, put, put together them in a different uh, way. And that's relatively easier than making every single Lego piece from scratch. Uh, and then the, the, the changing and shifting can be done very easily by inhibition. And we just had a paper in Neuron last month where we uh, have some data to support this idea that how we can, with inhibition, we can change the, uh, the, the Lego pieces and we can unmask uh, patterns that uh, we thought we put in the brain, but it turns out it was already in the brain <laughs> and so on. So, you know, with the, these kind of things, you, I can imagine that you can uh, have a, uh, let me step back. So how would I start if I were, were your age now and, and I want to be a, <laughs> a computational neuroscientist or I want to be an AI person? I would say, well, let's build a system that is brain-like. And what does it take to be brain-like? I said, well, we know a few things about this and, uh, you know, the diversity is one thing and so on. I'd like to have a brain that can be active for 
at least a month or a year <laughs> continuously maintaining his dynamic without shifting uh, deviating from these the this the plus minus one deviation or two deviations from a human brain or a rodent brain and that's a challenge but once you have a, a system like that then you said oh we satisfied yuri's first requirement which is the brain should <laughs> <maintain those dynamics. laughs> and and let's let's start from here and and then of course you know you can shovel the information here and you can perturb the neurons any way you want but what it's not a brain yet you know the, the way how i think about these things is that the brain of course is in the body and it's in an environment um and and uh, these are uh, interacting with each other the the way without if, if if you separate them it's it's the same thing as would would be looking at the hippocampus alone without uh, the rest of the the brain or you look at the thalamus alone that wouldn't give you very much and the same thing is you just look at the brain without the body then uh, you don't get very far so then the the second thing what this uh, ai brain should do is to generate an output and once you have an output then it could be random or it could be anything but then the the robot or the brain should know that there was an output that was me i'm the agent i'm the one who is controlling and that is the most important thing to register for the brain first the brain is interested in itself is not interested in the rest of the world you know in contrast to the idea about that the mind is there to learn the truth of the world we have no clue what the truth is and we don't care we just want to survive and so what do i have to do in order to survive generate an output without movement the, uh, the surviving survival probability is very 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 low without perception uh in, in the absence of the ability to act upon the perceived item is zero there's no utility for a brain to learn or, or perceive everything around the world if you cannot change that and so the, the, you have to generate the ability to change first you no know, and that's the important thing and now of course when the you generate an output and it is in a in a you know inert environment then you, you just register that happens but if there is uh something happening outside there then it's perturbing your outputs and perturbing your sensors that you build upon to watch your outputs and then uh, something will happen and that difference can be registered and then the brain can say or the ai builder can say oh this is the important thing this is what i have to perfect now i have to make a better eye now i have to make a, a better something else depending on the niche into which this robot is working you know if the if the if the the brain or the robot's uh, goal is to perceive ultraviolet light then you have to generate those sensors if you don't know how to if, if there are no sensors for the magnetic fields then that doesn't help very much so we, we know only a short a, a very narrow segment of what's happening outside in the world and the ones that we know and the the ones for which we have sensors for are all useful to guide our actions so this is the three steps <laughs> that i can <laughs> i'd i'd like to see you know to 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 build the, the future ai not as a, so this is not not right I, I i don't want to people to believe that you know i'm i'm thinking about ai this way the ai has its own goal even if it's independent of the brain it will never ever compute anything that is useful never generate anything that is useful to the brain it's a very important field on its own but if you would like to com contribute to how the brain works or contribute something to neuroscience then the three steps are important i heard you also mention at one point that this one over this log scaling is if if you were shown an artificial system if it had that had that property of the log scaling then you wouldn't believe it's it's brain inspired basically so do you think this is actually necessary for us to to build really a human like ai system or do you think it's it could be implemented in a completely different way say without having this kind of dynamic reservoir 
Well, you you always have to ask yourself, you know, what are the the fundamentals, the basics of that complex expression? You know, you mentioned one of worth. Uh, the, the important thing is that, aha, uh -huh, it is a complex system that is trying to deal with competing goals, if you want, and competing resources. And this is where diversity, as I mentioned earlier, comes from. So this is what we have to look at carefully and and, and say, why is it good and uh, and how do we build that? And it just turns out that this is so persuasive that is everywhere and at every level of the of brain organization that it comes to your mind as a thing that you cannot really neglect. If you do, then it's inevitably something goes bad. So, you know, let's just take a, a historical, psychological observation that one cannot ig ignore. And here I say this is an outside in, but it's a good one, <laughs> which is the Weber-Fechner law, <laughs> which is a log rule. And, you know, that's a Everybody agrees this is a fundamental useful rule, not only for sensation, but it works also for time perception, space perception, memory, and many, many things. Interestingly, over the past uh, 100 years or so, not too many people ask, you know, what is the brain mechanism? What is the neural mechanism of this fundamental mind law? And the approach that we have taken is that you say, well, are there any anatomical explanations and physiological explanation. To make the long story short, it turns out that, you know, the, the macroscopic connectivity of the brain follows a log rule. In other words, every structure in the brain is connected to a handful of structures very strongly, but to many, many, many structures relatively weakly, and it shows a distribution. And of course, vice versa, every structure receives input, strong input, from a handful of other structures, but receives inputs from many, 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 many structures. Uh, two years ago or three years ago, there was this uh, nice paper from the Allen Institute where they showed the connectivity distribution of the, the mouse brain atlas. And it's just a perfect bell-shaped distribution on a log scale. And it doesn't matter whether you look at one hemisphere, you look at both hemispheres, you are looking at cortex or looking at the entire brain and so on, it's there. Now, you, you jump to the other side, a single neuron, and you will find that the sizes of the synapses are also two, three orders of magnitude different. And it also follows a rule. If you look at axon diameters in every species, <laughs> you know, whether you look at the corpus callosum, you are looking at the optic tract or anywhere, they, should, they follow the same rule. Now, from the synapse size, of course, you can go to the synaptic strength, and the synaptic strength distribution is following the same log rule. And then if you look at the, the, the firing rates of the neurons, then it's three orders of magnitude difference. You, you take a thousand CA1 pyramidal cell or a thousand uh, uh, neurons from your favorite structure, it could be the ventral whole neurons of the spinal cord in a turtle, or in an elephant or in any species, everywhere the same rule occurs. And you can perturb this, you know, for a couple of days, the neurons do something else, but then they revert back to their own favorite uh, fingerprint pattern. So that's a interesting thing. Now, then you are, you, you can ask the question, you know, when we are having this conversation, what fraction of, of your brain or neurons in your brain are firing? And of course, it depends on the time frame, but let's say in a theta cycle and say, mm, what is the mean or the average fraction of neurons firing? And of course, that's a, a dumb question in a sense, because in a log scale distribution, a skewed distribution, there is no mean. And the answer is that anywhere between 0 0.1 to about 15% of the neurons can fire together. And it, it varies. So this enormous difference, how many neurons can fire, or what fraction of the neurons can fire together in a, in, a, in a time window. And we looked at this in various time windows, and it doesn't really matter, the time window, the, the, the fraction is enormously 
distributed in a, in a wide scale. So then, of course, it leads you to the log distribution of, uh, of brain rhythms and said, well, the macroscopic, the macroscopic dynamic organization of the brain is this skewed distribution that one way or another may, again, it's a may, relate to the psychophysical law of uh, Weber Fechner. Uh, but it can, you can go one step further and say how these different levels are related to each other. So just to think about it, there is a large neuron with a long axon that happens to be a fast-firing neuron. This neuron has access to other large neurons, with the higher propensity or probability than, than the other neurons. And then these fast-firing neurons, they are friendly with each other and they make a club. It's called the rich man, rich club so they have access to each other and they have access to information from the majority of the neurons and they are rulers they are responding all the time and this is what this collection of neurons what i call the good enough brain this good enough brain is there for you for the organism every time every single situation but if you would like to be Perfect, then of course you need the very large resources, and then you have to recruit the many, many, many other uh, low firing neurons because those neurons are the ones that, when they say something, they say something perhaps important. Uh, so, this is a, uh, a distribution based idea that, that there are no real antagonistic ideas. We, we, we are humans, so we are making things in, uh, packing the information into words, and the words are discrete, and we think that the world is discrete. But in fact, the, the brain representation is continuous in anything. So when we say familiar and novel, these are two distinct ideas. But in fact, in the brain, it's a, it's a continuum, and they happen to be on the two ends of this uh, skewed distribution. So when you look at the relationships of, of these biophysical properties and their, if you want, representative properties, it turns out that those neurons in the hippocampus that are fast firing, they have a larger field. They have more fields. They fire on more arms of a maze. They fire in multiple environments and so on. And you can call them generalizers. So there are neurons. These are the active neurons that always generalize and always says, say something. And it's not a tabula rasa then, because every single situation, you sh the, the brain says something or thinks something. There is nothing I can show you, nothing I can show you that you would say it doesn't exist. You would always generalize and say, oh, it is like. And you know, when you see a, a alien from the Mars, it comes to you, then automatically you would liken it to an animal or to, to a robot or something. So there is nothing new to the brain, even to the newborn brain. Everything is familiar to some extent or generalized. It's exploited or used for something. Only when there is some utility to learn about the differences, then the brain listens and expands. So when, you know, um, you know we are having this conversation across the Atlantic Ocean and I'm, I'm not in a lecture room, but if you brought me to a lecture room, I immediately would say, oh, think, oh this is a room. I've been to many rooms. It's a different room than I have been before, but you know, a very large part of it is, is important, or is, is familiar. So you know, it's important that you know, when we think about structures such as the hippocampus and say, oh, every single environment where we go in, there is a new map. No. The map is a continuous map that has familiar and unfamiliar elements. And, and that's an important thing is because not, if everything would be new, then the world would be very complicated. But what I want to know is that every single thing that is, is, is novel has elements of familiarity. You know, for, a, for, a, for an animal, there is no new mountain. <laughs> There is no new river, completely. You know that that is you know always generalized, and you know, and this is a 
and uh, you know important part of the the inside out thinking is that we have uh, this continuum as well as the, 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 every single situation that we confront will have elements of familiarity and at the same time it yeah. may have some novelty i'm now also mindful of your time so maybe we can move close to to the ending maybe move to like a meta perspective on on what science is or means to you and maybe you can give some advice to to people i mean you already gave some advice on how to <laughs> to build ai but yeah uh, for young researchers and people just starting out with research and maybe also neuroscience more specifically can you give any advice from your very successful career um I would be foolish to do that <laughs> because it would be in contrast to what I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that the, the drive of, of nature is diversity <laughs> and don't try to mimic anybody. <laughs> This yeah. is what I try to do in my career. You know, the, the most charismatic and the smartest person I ever met was my mentor in Hungary. And I thought he is the ultimate scientist. And I met many other people and I realized that they are so different, but they are still very good scientists. So just because you stumbled into a laboratory where you found a, a smart person and who influenced and, and uh, shaped your lifetime, it doesn't mean that you are that person. You are a different one. So try to find who you are and, and what satisfies you and, and uh, what satisfies you. And uh, this is what you have to do. The most important thing I think what I can say and I, I think this is true also, that there are only two difficult things in science. One is to find something that interests you. <laughs> yeah. And the second one is to make a living with it. And the rest, it is, the rest is easy. You know? and, uh, and what is interesting for you, of course, it depends who you are. You know, if you are a, uh, if, you, if you get a headache from centrifuges, then, don't work in that environment. If you don't like to pipe it, then don't do that. If you don't enjoy uh, making gadgets and tinkering with equipment, then don't work in an electrophysiology lab. 95% or 99% of, of our work is failure every single day. So we have to f substitute it with some sort of happiness that is we like the things that we do. And even if it's a, a bad day, not bad day, it's a good day, but you know, without any discovery, we just said, oh, uh, no, I nevertheless, I liked it, then, uh, then you are in a good profession. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to end it. So thanks again so much for, for taking the time. And Thank you, Manuel. It was nice to meet you. <laughs>